Welcome to the Loose Training Podcast. I'm Tyler Martin Olich, and joining me to my right is my sidekick, Jesse Brock. Hey, Jesse. Hi, how are you? I'm doing peachy. Good uh, morning. Good morning. We have a, a great show coming up today. We've got Michael Nielsen from Grain and Glass coming up in a little bit. Uh, but first, what's going on in Tampa Bay, Jesse? What's going on in Tampa Bay? What's not going on in Tampa Bay? We have so many productions happening every week, and it just keeps getting busier, which we love to see it. Uh, we do, and uh, just for those tuning in and watching, uh, we shoot this out of sequence, and if you see my hand shaking, it's because I'm now on my ninth cup of coffee, <laughs> uh, but it's good energy for an opening, right? Like, that's what they tell me anyway. Well, in small small doses. Are you saying you need me in small doses? <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's what that code is for. Uh, remember, I, I sign your paychecks every week. Um, so what have you been watching lately, Jesse? What's going on what in your world? What have I been watching? Yeah. Me personally? Well, no. Someone else named Jesse sitting across from me. Well, <laughs> me personally, I've been watching this show called Sweet Tooth. Have you heard of it? That's the Robert Downey Jr. one, right? Well, yeah. He produced it with his wife. Yeah. He's not in it. But it's like fantasy and it's really, really cool. They did like a very tasteful job of kind of like commenting on the past year without it being so like force fed. It's really, it's nice. I'm only two episodes in, so don't spoil anything. I haven't seen it, so no. Uh, It's really good. I don't know. You chose to watch that instead of F9? (laughs) Yeah. No. I mean, F9 is still on my list, guys. All right. Family. F9, the, the faster saga. Is that what the, the actual title is? I have no idea. It's something ridiculous like that. I mean, how did we get to nine how did Fast we get and Furious? From episodes? Fast and Furious to just F9. Uh, someone in marketing. <laughs> was like, how could they were we... like, we've run out of hashtags. <laughs> Hashtag F9. How can we save money on the poster? Just F9. F9. And a giant picture of Vin Diesel. <laughs> uh, Isn't that a key on the keyboard, F9? F9? It is. I don't know what it does. I don't think that was what they were thinking of, though. Press it. They're not that Vin clever. Diesel pops up on your screen. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, don't forget to talk to your family today. <laughs> uh, it's all about family, uh, which will play into our segment a little yeah. later on today. Yeah. Um, speaking of family. Speaking of family. Yeah. So we, uh, we're going to be interviewing Michael Nielsen here in a little bit mm-hmm. uh, from Grain Glass, yeah. which is one of our, our production companies here locally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they've done a really amazing job carving out a cool little space within Tampa Bay um, yeah. doing different things. They, they work with a lot of automotive brands. Mm-hmm. Um, really excited to have them on the show. Uh, we've been working with them for, I don't know, about six years on and off. In fact, they just did a, a commercial for our parent company here, uh, unrelated to the podcast, uh, a couple weeks ago, which yeah. is fun. Visit, um, visit Tampa Bay. But it's nice to see company. and talk to people here locally who are, are doing a lot of cool work and yep. are staying busy. I mean, I don't want to harp on the, the damn pandemic, but a lot of places just have not been popping right. lately. But since, like, not this just previous month may but last may florida's been doing really good you know for better or worse you know we opened up early uh the pandemic's certainly not over i don't want to give that impression um but we've we've opened our doors as a Mm -hmm. state and have been open for for a while now well i think that plays into it and i really just like their foundation as a company i mean that's kind of why people sometimes say tampa bay is a slice of midwest in florida um and talking to michael i feel like that's very apparent. I mean, their foundation is family, trust, respect, and I don't see that in a lot of production companies, you know, so. Yeah, no, it definitely fits, it's, what, what I want to say, on brand for Tampa Bay. <laughs> yep. Uh, if I can, can use that. You uh, can. But you're right, a lot of people say that, that we are sort of a slice of the Midwest, um, and I think that's partially because you don't meet anyone in, in Florida who's actually from Florida. Uh, most of them are, are transplants, though you are. You're like a 12th generation Floridian. I am. Uh, I just made that up. but I'm know. not. I'm a Floridian, but I'm first generation. First generation here. Floridian. Okay. Uh, Off a couple generations. Well, you know, one, 12, it's all the same. Uh, <laughs> it's a coffee. <laughs> it is a coffee, damn it. But no, you, you could line 10 people up from Tampa Bay right. and ask where are you from. One will say they're from right. Tampa Bay. The rest is, you know, I'm from I'm you know, Chicago, you know, Illinois, Michigan, yeah. wherever. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool to, to see a homegrown company that's mm-hmm. uh, been very successful despite the pandemic um, that has put down roots here in Tampa Bay and continues to grow. So with that, we'll be right back with Michael Nielsen. Welcome back to Loose Friday Podcast. I'm Tyler Martin Olich, and joining me now is Michael Nielsen with Grain and Glass, a Tampa Bay based production company just outside of Tampa and Lakeland. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for coming, man. Yeah, thank you. Good to be here. 
Uh, so let's get the uh, the good housekeeping question or Reader's Digest question out of the way. Give us a, just a quick rundown and elevator pitch of what Grain and Glass is. Yeah, so Grain and Glass is a production company uh, here in town. Uh, we've been around for six years now, and we really focus on working with advertising agencies in the commercial production space. Awesome. So coming from that direction, you know, you work with a lot of agencies, but you've also been within an agency. Uh, and I want to talk to you today about branding and what that means to a production company. So I think people have an idea of what a brand is, right? But I, too often it gets reduced down to this is a logo mm -hmm. from something that works outside of the industry. This is a, an icon like a you know, McDonald's arches that I recognize, which is ubiquitous. But a brand is so much more than just a logo. So from your experience, what is a brand and how does that you know tendril off into everything that that company does? Yeah, absolutely. So, as you mentioned, I got my start in the graphic design world. Worked my way up through art director, creative director. I was uh, uh, brought into Spark actually as a creative, and then took over uh, the production world. And throughout my career, I've been you know I love brands, uh, I'm a big design nerd in that way. And even when I started Grain and Glass, branding was important to me. You know, I, I got with the designer. I didn't want to do it myself. So we teamed up and came up with what our brand would be because that was important for me to have a, a consistent look and, and feel. But as I work with clients, that's still something that I see from them. And, you know, knowing kind of from the client side when I was at an agency, these guys at the agencies, they work forever on what that brand is, what the look and feel is, who the company is that they're trying to, to help advertise for or help market, and then they bring in a production company. So it's our job to make sure that we're communicating that brand through whatever it is we're producing. And for me, that starts through the treatment phase. So a lot of times with a, when an advertising agency reaches out to us as Grain and Glass, it's to provide a director's treatment. How are you as a company going to approach this job for us? And even the way I do my treatments, they're you know, designed out. I, I make sure our branding comes through, um, but I talk a lot about what their brand is and how, you know, my knowledge of it, at least my take on what they're asking us to do, and then how we're going to bring that to life. So yeah. it's always important for me to make sure that, you know, the client has come to us with their own vision. I know they want to hear how we're going to do it, and they look to me to, to do that, but they have a point of view as well, and it's super important for us to know what that is and understand it. Yeah. Do you do you think consumers are aware of just how affected they are by brands? I mean, they, they say the sign of a good edit is that you don't notice the edit. Mm -hmm. And is that also true for brands? You know, you, you have these subtle colors and hues that show up in certain ads that, that all call back to whatever their brand or style guide is. I mean, how, how aware do you think the average person is of just what's going into a brand and everything they consume from that particular company? Yeah, I don't think most consumers realize all the work that goes into that. You know, there's tons of research, there's firms that just focus on branding or even the reason behind the branding and because it works. And I don't think your average consumer realizes what's gone into that or, you know, what's making them feel the way they do. As it relates to commercial production, you know, you can look at a, a, a certain brands, like whether it's, you know, Progressive Insurance or Geico or whatever, those ads have a brand, you know, the, whether it's the lighting, the the music, the style, you know who they are based on what it is. And one of the earliest examples, that, at least in my career, that I can think of was the Target commercials. You know, they had that style to them. And they come on TV and you'd go, oh, it's a Target commercial. Yep. And nine times out of ten, you were right because they had a style and that style is the brand. And, and I don't think people, and it, maybe to some degree, people do realize it, but it's so important in the way a brand communicates yeah. to, to others. And you, you have a production company that does a lot of service work. So it's, mm -hmm. it's work that's coming from an agency. A lot of times the campaign's already spelled out. You know, you're given the boards like, here, create this. Um, how much research on your end goes into understanding that, that brand? And is there a space that you feel you work best in? I know you do a lot of car commercials, mm -hmm. but is there other uh, brands or, or, or types of products that, that really fit your wheelhouse? Yeah, so when we get a project in, especially if it's a client I haven't worked with before, 
and you know we're all busy so i do my best to just take at least a day and dive into that brand whether that's watching what they have done going to their website doing as much research into the look and feel of who they are or what type of customer they're trying to talk to is it is it an affluent customer is it your you know average blue collar you know who is it who are we talking to because that obviously affects how we need to approach the job in the way we produce it and that you know goes to lens choice it goes to lighting everything is affected by what they're already doing um what was the second part of your question sorry <laughs> <laughs> you that's fine. i'm sorry no you know you guys do a, a lot of uh car automobile uh, style products mm-hmm. or, or, or commercials uh, for particular brands. Uh, Bentley, Toyota mm-hmm. comes to mind, um, and they're they're amazing spots. And and uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll run some under this. Uh, is that what what drove you to that interest? How did you you from your background end mm-hmm. up? Did you always like cars? Did you just feel natural in that space? I mean, it's how'd funny. You end up there? Yeah, I'm not what you would call a car guy. You know, I don't I don't have four cars sitting around that I'm working on at any given time, but You know, as a kid, I always loved automobiles, but that's not really what got me into it. Like at my previous jobs before this, we didn't do a lot of automotive work, but every once in a while we got to touch something in the automotive industry and I always loved it. Um, One of my first opportunities when I started Grain and Glass, I had a good friend that at an agency who had some automotive work and we started in that space and it was just this natural fit for us. There's something about it. I think it's the mix of, you're working with people and talent, but also great looking cars. Yeah. And even, you know, we did this one one uh, video early on. One of the first things I did, it was uh, we got to work with a, we basically drove a trophy truck, which is like the race trucks that do like the Baja 1000. And it was a produced spot out in the desert in Nevada, uh, right outside of Las Vegas. And it was so much fun. Just the ability to like create things, make stuff up as you go, but have this awesome looking truck and come up with what you're doing. It just, it's one of those things that you, I don't know, you find your way into yeah. and it just feels right. And so with, with Bentley, it was this almost perfect combination for us because for that one, we got to work, you know, we, we had to highlight their car. It was the Bentayga, their SUV at that time. But they were working with an influencer, this uh, chef out of Nashville who was amazing to work with, just a, a really good person. And it's one of those jobs where the, the team was right. It was a very small crew. It's not like your average commercial. There was, I think there was three or four of us, you know, and that's the way Brain and Glass, a lot of times we have to approach things is, yeah. you know, our audio guy is on it, a DP, another camera op, and we just go in and do the best we can. But those are the kind of jobs that I love where we're almost looked to to help create that brand for them. There's not as many eyes, even though it's a huge brand, it's national, it's international, but we're trusted to come up with something and and help come up with that look. And it's almost that like commercial documentary space. Mm -hmm. That's where we really find kind of our our niche or things that we really love to do. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. I mean, we were talking about brands and how people you know, target you, when you mm-hmm. saw that commercial lead in, you knew exactly what the product was or what the company was before they ever put the logo up on the screen. I think you can, you can reduce a lot of production companies or, or DPs or directors, um, down to their body of work. When you mm-hmm. see something like, Oh, I know who that, who shot that. Mm-hmm. Right. And when I look at what you guys do, uh, what grain and glass does, it does have that, that documentary feel. And I'd almost call it organic, but organic in the sense that it has a rhythm, a pulse, and a mm-hmm. realness. Uh, even the car commercials, which you know, objectively, it's it's a you know two ton piece of steel. <laughs> you still find a way to make it feel alive, and mm-hmm. and, uh, and you do that with the edit and the, the camera choices. Um, how did you arrive at that style, and, and what from your background did you pull on to sort of end up there? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I I think of myself as a very picky person my wife would tell you that I'm super particular about stuff Um, so I'll watch and again it goes back to doing your research I'll watch what other people are doing and not necessarily other DPs but just in the the big space of things you know what are what are car companies doing what are luxury car companies doing what are not luxury car you know whatever it is and then I don't know I think that's what makes us all different is we all have our own voice and our own style and there's just things that I see that I'm like well I don't like that I'm not going to do it that way and that's how we found our style is you know I want things to look good we all want things to look good but that's where taste comes in you you know you have to know what it is that you like about something and you don't and 
you know, try to emulate that or try to find your own voice. And that's what we did early on was, you know, I'm going to approach it this way, right or wrong. And thankfully it was right. I mean, yeah. you know, we all have to take those risks and we just, you know, we just try. And that's part of editing too. You said, you know, editing is a lot of what goes into it. And that's one of the, the things I love to do because you see, as anybody does, you can see how, how much an edit can change things. Music choice, voiceover choice, the color. And we've had projects that we've shot that they'll have somebody else edit and you look at it and you're like, well, that's not right. Or even a client edit, you know, they'll, they'll have their requests and, you know, you, you do them because that's what you're hired to do. Yeah. But I, one of the things that I've always tried to do, especially lately, is make sure I do a director's cut because I want to show what my vision was. And there's so many times where even the client has come back to us afterwards. And I'll, Bentley's a great example. I talked to them after we had done their spot. I did a director's cut that I just put on our website and had a call with them about another project later. And like, we saw the director's cut on your website and that was perfect. I don't know why we didn't run that one. It's like, well, I sent it to you in the, you know, I'm not, I should, yeah. we can edit that part out, but you know what I mean? <laughs> but anyway, there's, there's something that goes into all your choices, all your styles. That's what you put it all together and you make those, it's those little decisions throughout what, and it starts in pre-pro and your lens choice and you know, the, the locations you pick all that. But if you don't edit it right, you're not getting that feeling across. And I think that's one of the biggest things for us is making sure when you're done, when that edits out, that the feeling that you came up with in that treatment comes through in the edit and that you hit that right, everything comes together. Yeah. Uh, we live in a, an age now where there's not an industry in the world that doesn't engage with digital media in, in some shape or level. Uh, I mean, if you aren't putting things out on social media, whether that's, that's videos or doing things like a podcast, you're just not communicating. You're not mm -hmm. keeping up with the expectations of what you know your, your audience or your, your consumer wants. Um, has that changed the the types of projects that are brought to you over the years and, and how has that developed your own business skills and what you're bidding on? Yeah, definitely. I think the social landscape has definitely impacted us. There's seems to be less and less true broadcast work or especially broadcast only work. I think what we're seeing a lot and I think we've done really well with is the projects that come in that are multifaceted. They want yeah, there's going to be a broadcast, but there's going to be some social cuts, but they also need stills and you're trying to balance all that um, and deliver for the client on all those different touch points. Yeah. And that's different than when I started, for sure. Uh, back when I started my career, we were doing mainly broadcast and then, you know, maybe a YouTube cut would creep in here and there, whatever that was to people. But now it's, I mean, it's guaranteed you're going to do a 15 second cut down or a six second for a pre-roll on YouTube and then the one-to-one, -one. you know, there's, there's so many different edits now. I mean, I think more than ever, you know, it's not just a 16 by nine, we're done. It's, yeah. there's so many formats and you have to be well-versed in that and know, well, what works here or, or when the client even asks for something, you got to do your research and go, okay, nine, 16, one-to-one, 16, nine, how am I going to do that in the most efficient way possible? Cause unfortunately you don't get three extra days to do the social part yeah. of the shoot, you know, so it's definitely impacted what we do. So I mean, I hate even bringing this up, but you know, all filmmakers are storytellers. <laughs> um, <laughs> it just sounds trite yeah, yeah. if I say it, but you know, now you're, you're working in a space where you do have those, those 15 second spots and mm -hmm. how the hell do you even communicate something in 15 seconds? I mean, it, it really has to be the strength of the visuals at that point. Yeah. I mean, how do you even think about that and how then do you take a, a campaign that's, you know, 30 seconds, you know, 60 second long piece and then. How do I tell that same thing or get something out of that in 15 seconds? Yeah, that's been one of the, the toughest things because I know the ideal for all of us is to tell that story. And that story usually takes the form of, I mean, ideally we'd have 60 seconds or two minutes to really yeah. get something across because you want, you want something to develop. You want an opening and a close. And I think with a 15 second, the hard part is you're in the action and you're out of it. And you still have to get them to realize like, oh, what happened? So it's coming up with, you know, what's the shortest form of this story cut out all the fluff basically and it's it's hard but i think to help communicate it for us it's really you know and we the way i shoot things is a lot you know i don't just shoot the one second we need for that cut we make sure to have a little story around it those moments and because a lot of times you're taking the in-between something maybe you weren't looking for but 
the actor gave you this smile or you had this genuine reaction between a, a father and a son or whatever and that's what you're pulling maybe it's not what you planned on and i think for us it's making sure we allow ourselves to find that you know build that time into whether you have 30 minutes for this setup or or not make sure you have a little bit of time to do that uh, but then you know a lot of it too comes down to our choices when we're doing post you know how how are we editing this to make sure we don't lose sight of what that story is or is it saying anything in those 15 yeah. seconds so let's uh, let's switch to uh, you as a business owner now mm -hmm. and how that's sort of changed over the last couple of years. You know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you had these giant megalithic production companies and they'd have 15, 20, you know, DPs and, and directors, you know, and they're, they're stable and they would just throw whatever they thought was best for a, a product mm -hmm. or a pitch out of their stable. And now we've seen that sort of diversified and, and broken up. Uh, into small boutique style production companies. I don't want to reduce you guys to a, no, no, you're good. a boutique uh, <laughs> studio, but I think that engenders a lot of loyalty with mm -hmm. a, a brand or a company or agency you work with now. Now you're not just one of 50, 60, 50 you know, clients or whatever. You're working with one brand, mm -hmm. one agency over and over again. You're able to develop a relationship. So as a, a business owner, how, is you, how have you seen the industry change over the last 10 years and how would you describe the space you're currently working in? Yeah, so I definitely think one of the changes we've seen has been the expansion of the social platform. Uh, before, we'd work with a broadcast producer. Now, those roles have changed. The, those old broadcast producers are probably gone from the agency, and we have multifaceted producers who have to think about everything. So we've had to see ourselves adapt to that and know who we're talking to and, and working with. We have made that conscious decision to stay small um, because right or wrong, I don't, I don't wanna lose sight of who we are as a company, our brand, you know, what we're trying to create and what we're doing. I didn't wanna just have all these interns or all these young people who you know, you send them off on a project, you get it back and you're like, oh, that's not what I would have done because that's not sustainable. Yeah. So we've kept ourselves small and we've seen it work. We've worked really hard at developing relationships with people. Um, and I can remember back through even just times in my ownership of this company where I wish I had done something a little different, whether it was focusing more on a certain client and not the, the brand or thinking, oh, I'll always have this client. Yeah. It's like, no, that, but I should have made friends with that guy, you know, and, and not to, I don't know how to say this in the, the best way for your, for your edit, but you know, not to kiss their ass or not to always just do what they want, yeah. but they are important. And I think that's some, one of my biggest learnings is learning who it is we're working with, what they want out of it and how I as a director and how my team as a company can add value to them and really be looked at as a, and this is a, again a corny saying, but you know, as a trusted partner. We don't want just these one-time jobs and keep looking for the next one, keep looking for the next one. I, I've built my career on stable relationships because I feel like we're really good at what we do and we work so hard. Anytime we get a job, I hate to say no matter what the budget is, but you know, that's, that's another benefit of keeping things small is I can look at a job and go, you know, you only have X for this. Well, I'm going to put in more because I think this could be a, a great piece for us or I really like them as a person. And you just do a little extra, whether that's an extra day of filming, if I can afford it, or just more time in the edit. You know, I don't, I don't nickel and dime people. I think that's something that I know when I was on the client side, I hated seeing is, well, that's going to cost you this. And that's, and I, I hate getting it from yeah. whoever it might be when I'm working with somebody. So I try not to do that. Of course, if it makes sense, I'm going to do it. I'm not just going to be a pushover, but I always want to give everything I have. So that's, again, staying small has helped me to not think I have to take on every project just because I have to pay, make a payroll. Yeah. It's helped me be a little more selective and really work on who I like working with, but also projects that I feel are are right for us. Yeah. So let, let's talk a little bit about crews, just because you brought mm -hmm. up building those relationships. You know, uh, Florida, and I'm not just talking about Tampa Bay, but Florida as a market at large. You know, we're a, a big, small market. And what <laughs> I mean by that is that there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of spaces, a lot of cities that people can shoot, but there's very few crew compared to, you know, an LA or a, mm. a New York. And that certainly doesn't speak to the quality of the crew. I think we have some of the best crews in the nation, but there's not a lot of them. So, right. uh, you know, we have a, 
especially in the Tampa Bay area, like we have the luxury if you're a crew person to be a little choosy about what projects you want to jump on because mm-hmm. you know if you wait a week, someone that you do like to work with is probably <laughs> going to call you. So you know why you know take the risk or work with someone you don't want to. You know how is how is your approach to you know running a set and building those relationships? You know, not necessarily different, but unique to you. Yeah. So I and I've heard this from other people, and it's definitely something that I try to do is even with crew that I'm hiring is just to be nice to everyone. Um, I run, I feel like I run a pretty calm set. There's no reason to yell. You know, nobody likes being yelled at. Everybody likes being respected and honored. You know, you hired this, whoever it is, it might be a wardrobe stylist assistant. You hired her for a reason. So treat her right, you know? And I've found that over the years, that's how I can get who I want because I'm always nice to people. I respect them. I think they respect me. And then my dad, one of the funniest things he told me right when I was thinking of starting this company, he said, make sure you treat your vendors well. Pay them on time. Pay them early if you can. And I've always done that. I don't want people calling me at 30 days saying, hey, where's my check? Unless I forgot, you know, I'm busy. I forget things. But I always pay them right away. And it's just those, it's treating someone how you want to be treated. It's, it's just the, that's the foundation of what we do. And that helps me, I feel like, to when I've got a job, and maybe it's a little less of a budget, I can get who I want. Yeah. Or it's it's a tight time frame, and I always pay people what they're worth. I definitely do that. But by treating people the right way, it helps to to build those crews the way you want and have a good um, good reputation yeah. with them. No, and you, you certainly do. And you know that's one thing you know, in my capacity as a film commission, if someone's gonna bitch or, or yell or complain, they'll find a way to get to my cell phone. Like, hey, did you hear what happened on set? Like. Everyone complains to me. I feel like I should be a therapist at this point. Um, but I've never heard of a complaint in the 10 years I've been doing this from from a production that, that you've helmed. Great. Uh, which is a, a good thing to hear, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, uh, let's start wrapping this up uh, and talk a little bit about what your direction is going forward and, and how that, that may or may not change. We're coming out of a pandemic, and I don't want to harp on that. But mm-hmm. it's been a strange, long road the last couple of months. We were talking offline um, about how Florida was, you know, uh, slightly better situated than a lot of other states to, to get back on their feet for a variety of reasons, wrong or right. Um, but what is what is the future looking like for you coming out of this pandemic? And have you switched anything in those months where you, you might not have been working as much? So in the months right after the pandemic broke, you know, it did give us a lot of time to think about who we are and who we wanted to be. Thankfully, I had kept things small enough where I didn't have to make any changes. I didn't have to lay anybody off. It was, you know, we definitely took a hit, but it was important to try to keep people on. um, And we were able to do that. Um, But in looking at who we were and who we wanted to be, I was honestly pretty happy with what we had going. It was just focusing on those relationships. And since the, I don't say the pandemic's over, it's not over, but since things have lightened up a little, it's crazy how busy things have gotten here in in Florida and and for us it's no exception I think moving forward for me I'd love to find a place where I can be even more choosy about what I work on Um, I there's projects I love and there's projects I don't love as much and I'd love to only do what I love but you know that's what we all want to do so finding that balance for me um, the balance of growth the balance of family you know I I don't want to always be working um and i think that's something i struggle with is even you know why i founded grain and glass as a production company and not as michael nielsen productions is because i want it to have legs past me i would love to bring in at some point you know younger directors that i can help groom and train that one day you know i'm executive producer sitting back and helping guide things so that you know, our company has legs and has growth, but I'm not working as much. Yeah. So, so final question here, you're from Tampa Bay, Mm -hmm. you know, you've chosen to, to put your company, your stakes in the ground here. Um, do you think to grow and to, to find those, you know, elusive, you know, high end brand jobs Mm -hmm. like a Louis Vuitton or a Miller high life, Mm -hmm. or why did I say high life, just Miller light for Christ's sake. I'm the only one who drinks Miller (laughs) high life. Uh, uh, you have to be, in a Chicago, New York, mm-hmm. Atlanta, or, or LA, or can you be successful and grow as a company in a place like Tampa Bay? Yeah, um, I definitely think that's changing a little. I know right when I started, 
there was, and there, there may still be, but there was definitely a, I don't know, a snobbery, you could say, to, oh, it's an L.A. director, it's a New York director. And that still happens. I think especially in the agency world, you do see that where, you know, they're, and they're good for a reason. They are. They're, they're very talented. Um, but I do think Tampa has a great talent pool. I think there's people here who are doing amazing things. And I think as, you know, things start to even out, people don't look as at a location as much. We can all travel. Uh, we all have talent. And I think it's up to each one of us to really keep pushing and keep building who we are as artists, as, as creatives, yeah. as people. Uh, and putting that back in our community helps so much because we want to bring those clients here. We want to have Tampa be looked at as a, a great place for production. And I think it is, and I think it's only getting better. All right. Well, I can't ask for a better ending to a segment than that, <laughs> uh, especially as the Tampa film commissioner. So thank you <laughs> for the endorsement. Um, Michael, it's been a, a true pleasure. So I really thank you for coming and sitting yeah. down with me and uh, all the best and uh, appreciate what you do for the local community, man. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Now on my 14th cup of coffee. Uh, <laughs> Who's counting? <laughs> uh, joining me again is, is Jesse Brock. Hey, Jesse. Hey. Yeah, that was a fun little segment. Yeah, it was really engaging, and I couldn't stop listening. It was really, really nice. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. I mean, his background is, is branding, creative directing. Right. Uh, he's worked with a huge brand like a, a Publix. He was their creative director for a long while. Which makes a lot of sense to how he's kind of transitioned from Publix, which is huge and like family branding in that type of way to where he is now. Yeah. So. But, you know, he also was the, the head of studio production for Spark, which is a mm -hmm. large agency here, as I mentioned on the podcast earlier. Uh, but, yeah, it was fun. And it's it's interesting to hear his perspective on, on brands and how he integrates his own mm -hmm. style, but also does the research and the footwork to figure out what a, a company's brand is and, right. and make sure that all melds he has, together. He has that perspective of being a client, being inside the agency, working with agencies. He's kind of like very well-rounded. So. Yeah, absolutely. And he's also just an amazing photographer too. I mean, uh, we didn't bring that up really during the podcast, but um, you know, he's got some serious chops behind the camera too. Mm -hmm. So uh, that all, that all cooks together to, to make a beautiful meal. Yeah. Um, and it was just, you know, refreshing to, to hear what they're up to. Yep. Um, so what did you take away? I mean, what well, was like your one personally, thing? Personally, my favorite part was the director's cut um, because there might not be production companies that do this, but everybody wants to do this. Everybody wants to, if you're a director or whatever, heading up a production, they're like, this is how I envisioned it. And then once the client came back with those changes, this is what you guys got. But when he sends that final product, he also sends the director's cut. And like nine times out of 10, the client is like, well, I like the director's cut. Why didn't we go with that? <laughs> and he was like, I gave that to you guys. Yeah, I'm glad uh, you like it. Now. As someone who edited it for years, uh, that is always the case. I love that. Uh, they, they will. Uh, I don't want to bag on any particular client or agency, right, but right. they'll come back with just some wild, strange requests. It's like, really? I just don't think that's a good idea. But they're the client, right. you're, you know. Well, you're they doing service work. They overcomplicate it and they overthink it. They do. Really, they do. it's got to be, you know, back down to. Well, the and ultimately, I think there's there's a lot of cooks in that that kitchen too on the agency side, where yes. the person you're interacting with isn't necessarily the person that's giving the feedback, you know, and that that pollutes the whole situation. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it's like playing a game of telephone, right? Like, yes. hey, I I don't like this, and that gets communicated to you differently than how the person intended it. So, exactly. Uh, no, I thought that was that was cool, and I. I I, you know, I don't think that's unique to Michael. I think a lot of production companies yeah. try to do that, this or at least, or it. at least reserve the right to have their own director's cut for their own reel. Well, exactly. Well, yeah, that obviously happens for their reel. They keep all those beauty shots. But another thing I liked is how precise and how picky and choosy he is with um, not only the people he works with. He's developed that network, but just the shots that he chooses, and I just like how precise he is. Yeah. So attention so, to detail. Yes, attention detail. But I also liked, uh, we were joking about uh, F9 or Fast and Furious 9. It's all about the family. It's the worst Vin Diesel impersonation <laughs> ever. Uh, <laughs> I think I need to be a corpse to actually match his cadence and, and energy on screen. Uh, sorry, Ben. Um, but I, it was nice to hear his approach to, to working with crews because I've been on a lot of sets and you have so many different personalities mm -hmm. and you have those people who are always an inch away from just totally losing it 
or they're already cranked up to ten and a half, and it's mm-hmm. just going to take one thing to tweak them to eleven, and yeah. the whole whole set devolves into to yelling and and just nastiness, and it doesn't yeah. need to be that way. It kind of ruins the vibe and the culture, and like why you're there in the first place to create and collaborate, you know, and. Yeah. When, like you said, too many cooks in the kitchen, it kind of gets... But that tone's also set by the director on set. It always yes. is. Yeah. Uh, if you have a director that, that's high-pitched and likes to yell, that translates to the crew. And, and they're going to be a little more hyper-aware and, and you know on edge. Whereas if you keep it nice and sagwine, mm-hmm. it's a nice, smooth set. You know, you're, you're making Easy a widget. Breezy. Yeah, you're making a widget at the end of the day. And I don't want to be too reductive with, with the way right, you know, right. people shoot know products. Right, right. But we all know what we're doing, you know. It's a widget, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and there's there's no one living or dying off of that shoot. So you don't need to to make it crazy. So it, it was nice up. to hear. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, let's wrap this up, Jesse Brock. Where can they find us? We are Loose Framing. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. And where can they find us on social media? At Film Tampa Bay. And we hope you guys join us. Uh, stay tuned. We've got more exciting guests coming up in the, uh, the episodes to come. But with that, signing off, Tyler Martinovich, and to my right, Jesse Brock. See you guys. Bye.